Okay, I would like to talk to you today a little bit about uh, three elements that uh, entrepreneurs um, tend to experience in their lives, conflict, failure and rebirth. Now for those who aren't in the know, an entrepreneur is someone who takes advantage of opportunities in the market, um, ha takes on an element of risk to be able to gain some kind of financial return. Um, in more recent times, it's not just to get a financial return, for some it's also to get a social return or even an environmental return. So entrepreneurs are about people taking advantage of opportunities, turning them into an idea, into something real, and taking on the financial risk that goes with that. And they do that in new ventures, which are these days called startups. And startups are run by what I like to term upstarts, people who are really wanting to drive change. And I love entrepreneurship because um, generally I found ideas are great and most of them have them. It's only when you put them into some kind of commercial model, and I use the term commercial model fairly broadly to say for profit or not for profit, it's only when you put it into that model that that idea really starts to become real and put out to market to the users where it has its most impact. So I want to give you a bit of an insight of the world that I've had over the past few years and an insight um, to the world that many of the people around me are in right at this moment. And you'll see that it is not that comfortable. It is not an easy place to be. Um, and I will talk about these people like they are rock stars. And I'm their groupie. They are my heroes and I love them dearly for it. So just to give you a little bit of context, a, a bit about me generally. I'm from far north Queensland, good country girl. Um, in an area where, you know, ambition and opportunity was a little limited. Um, if you couldn't dig out of the ground, if you couldn't hit a ball or play sport, um, if you couldn't pull beer at the bar, you know, opportunities were a bit, uh, a bit low. And expectation was low as rounds. You know, I wasn't brought up in a high achieving family. Um, I, I failed my school. I wandered around the world a little bit, or I wandered in my teenage years for a couple of years, and then I moved. And there was something in me that realised that regional North Queensland was probably not the only place around, that there was a bigger world around there and perhaps I should start to go and experience it. So my early days were my wasted years. It led me to Brisbane, which was my exploratory years, and there actually I, I kind of tapped into a, a thirst for learning and knowledge. And it became a rather um, a, a strong thirst. I, I studied. I studied more, I studied in business, I studied in psychology, I studied in social sciences, I studied in education, I informally studied in arts history, theology, philosophy. All of a sudden the gates were open, I couldn't get enough information and data. I suddenly also realised Australia was growing very, very small. So I took off and left overseas like all good young Aussies do to go backpacking across to the UK and I didn't quite make the UK. And it didn't happen in the three months that I thought it was. It took two years. And I right across Southeast Asia and right across South America. And during that whole time, I had two years of being able to observe individuals in small businesses, craft industries, in all sorts of cultures. And, and it was a, a wonderful, rich experience for me. It brought me to a little place called Israel in 2000. And that became my formative years. That was where the thirst for knowledge and learning was satisfied um, in amongst a great group of people who were not just learning, creating, inventing, but then also applying all of their ideas into um, businesses, startups that were being pushed out across globally. It was a phenomenal time for me for four years from 2000, when in fact Israel was going through a very difficult stage because for technology companies, which I was really interested in, um, they were suffering badly in what was called the dot-com um, crash. So many founders in technology were really struggling to get those ideas out into commercial models while the markets were all collapsing around them. But anyway, four years in there, um, Israel's 600 square kilometres, a hive of hundreds of thousands of really entrepreneurial people trying to do great stuff. Um, I learnt the, the beautiful term sweat equity, where you work for a company and you sweat it out, you don't get paid, but you own a part of that company and you are aiming for an exit at the end of that company. You're selling that out for a return on your time, um, which was then called a golden parachute. And we were all looking for the golden parachutes. We were all, you know, creating these companies, or, or, or all these people where I was coming into it, where they were all starting it. And I, 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 you know, drank the Kool-Aid, I loved it. 
So, and a couple of my companies that I was in um, survived. Some of them did not. My first one died. Um, I was the last standing employee before they kind of put the bullet to us and said, that's it, you know, it's over, we've done our best. Um, another one actually went on and, and is now a market leader in Eastern Europe in its particular product line. So, you know, there's some wins, um, there's some um, failures on there. But just to give you an idea, I guess, you know, good old little country girl in a, in a particular area where this was sort of happening. And I'll just give you some numbers. And I've got the memory of a goldfish. I'm going to recite these a little bit for you. But Israel at the time, most physicians and engineers per capita, third scientific research institutions in ranking across the world, ranked seconds in, second in space sciences, produced the third most um, scientific papers per capita in stem cell research, most Israeli patents were registered in the United States. Sorry, they had the most patents registered in the United States. Um, then Russia, India, and China combined. So that's a population of around 2.5 billion. And Israel's population at the time was 6 million. So more stats for you, very quickly. Israeli companies invented drip irrigation. So their deserts were receding, not expanding like the rest of the world. They discovered the world's most uses of, or they have the drug for the uh, most use for multiple sclerosis, and they have a huge pharmaceutical industry that's emerged out of there. They designed a number of the Pentium chips, not produced them, they were the inventors and the designers of those chips. They created instant messaging, they went on to lead things like peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer messaging, and then Skype, and, and that kind of model. Um, get this, Israeli cows produce more milk per cow than any other cow in the world. Very, a few more, just again. Third highest rate of entrepreneurship for women. That's pretty important for someone like me, where, where most of the entrepreneurs in the world are male. They attracted the most venture capital coming in, 30 times more than Europe. They have uh, more NASDAQ listed companies combined, um, India, Europe, China, Japan, and uh, very quickly in absolute numbers, um, they have you know, some of the largest and, and have the most startups in the world, besides the US, I should say now. So this was you know, a pretty important time to be around in Israel um, when you're the most impressionable, um, particularly in the ICT space. So it was very, very exciting for me. So I went back to Sydney in 2007 after this experience, uh, sorry, in 2004 after this experience, and I brought some of the learnings, the observations, the two years of traveling the world back into um, a, a quieter environment, but um, with no less potential in there. You know, we have the same number of Nobel Peace Prizes. Um, our global innovation rankings, Australia and Israel is the same. But what's interesting, we're three times the population. So you think we've got the potential there, and we do. So, so I'm about trying to draw out the potential in, indiv in individuals, not to match Israel in any way, it's not a competition, but to see that there are others doing something really interesting. We can do the same. So I worked for Canon for a little while. What's interesting is Canon, in any given year, is the second or third highest patenting entity besides IBM in the world. Sadly, there for me, they were patenting, um, you know, so that shows innovation, but they're patenting in photocopiers and cameras which was not so exciting for me, but it was a great experience to work in a very large corporation um, and work as a role as an entrepreneur. That is to take on the risk within a large organization of, um, of developing new initiatives and programs that would lead to you know, benefit for the company. I then also came, went on and did some re uh, work with an entity called Uniquest, which sits up here in Queensland, working with researchers who have these fantastic ideas that are going to change our future and allowing them to go on the academic path while we took their ideas into the commercial path. And in more recent times, that's not just with the researchers, that's with any mum and dad inventor who's got this beautiful idea that's going to change our world and we help them do it in a commercial model. And that's in an organisation that's called iLab now. And iLab, iLab takes in at any given cycle up to two, well, takes in uh, expressions of interest of around 250 people in every program that we run where we help those entrepreneurs and we seed fund them. Ten might get accepted. Six will be lucky to get through to the end of it. 
So it's pretty tough environments getting an idea from, you know, getting people to back that idea and buy into that idea and then to start to build it up and get it out to the world and test it and trial it. And I want to talk a bit about that environment now. So I work with a certain kind of personality and these people are not compliance, you know, they don't, they're not followers. Um, they're the ones who are kind of stepping out on a limb a little bit. They like it when it's a bit uncomfortable and I term them um, mavericks. And I think there's probably a bunch of mavericks in the room here. I think I've spoken to you already. Um, and mavericks are highly or, or willfully independent people. They're highly talented. They're particularly blunt. They're very pragmatic. They break rules, but they're very goal-oriented. The downside with mavericks is they really can be really, really abrupt, really abrasive, because they see something far better than any of us see. They can see how it begin, can be done more efficient, how it's more useful, how, how there's a, a, a more effective way of doing what we're doing. And they get frustrated because none of us can see it. The upside is that they really do change the world. And these are the folks that I like to hang around with. These are the guys that are really, really interesting people. They are the future makers. And these are some of the mavericks that we kind of walk around with. And I could put some other photos up there. You know, Richard Branson's a great maverick. We all know him. Dick Smith is a local maverick. These are local mavericks, Sydney and Brisbane. A lot of Brisbane people are hanging out at iLab at the moment. And all of them are successful business people, successful entrepreneurs. Most of them do it for profit. There's a number of them are actually doing it for not-for-profit as well in different, in different ventures. I'll talk about three very quickly for you. You probably would know some of them. Here down the bottom we have uh, Mike Cannon-Brooks, Scott Farquhar from a company called Atlassian. I love this photo, it's from the Australian Financial Review um, which did a bit of an article on them recently and they're in the news all the time now. Why? Because they've built a global business in a number of, in a short time, which is now analysts saying over, we're valued over a billion dollars. That's phenomenal. Australia's never kind of seen that sort of activity or that kind of business in the ICT space. Let's not talk about, you know, pharmaceuticals or petrol. IT is kind of where I've got focus. So these guys are rock stars in the startup world for us. Matt Barry, who's used Freelancer? Knows about Freelancer? A few hands there. So freelancer.com is a website that does, uh, you know, transactions for freelancing consulting work for services. Seven million people are on that platform now. I met Matt, Matt a few years ago. I, he doesn't even know who I am these days, I don't think. I, I saw him at a CBIT conference. I walked past and he was spruiking this new project, new product called freelancer.com. Gave me a t-shirt. So here, try it out, try it out. It's going to be the next best thing. It's brain stuff. And, and Matt's a pretty driven guy. You know, he, he was really focused. I've met him a couple more times as well, and each time he's been really, really focused. So, um, it's an interesting thing. That's a company now from a few years ago of starting is valued at around $270 million or up to $270 million according to analysts. He's really built a lot of value and he's built it out as a global business. If you ever see Matt on LinkedIn, you'll see him rant about the systems and, and organisations and governments. He's a true maverick in really wanting to change the way people are and, and the way systems operate, particularly in Australia. Steve Baxter is a local business person here and he's doing great things in terms of supporting startups and supporting founders. Steve started a company in 2001 with a friend or a colleague and built that up and sold it for $370 million by 2010. He got sick of a government infrastructure that wasn't working and he decided to lay his own. He saw an opportunity, he was frustrated that others couldn't see it and couldn't change so he did it himself. So this is the world they live in. So these guys are constantly dealing with conflict. And conflict that they either create or they, they love operating in. Conflict for many of us feels really prickly. It's uncomfortable. Conflict for them is an opportunity to bump around, have fun. Because every bump is an inflection point where there's an opportunity for, to doing something different and to doing something better. They operate in a world of failure. Who's failed at something? My God, look at all those hands. And it's an ouch moment where it happens. And we all remember it. 
We all remember it. It's not an easy process to go through and fail, or even to stand up and say, I failed at something, because we all love successes. We all want success. We, or some of us, see failure as this long, dark, uncomfortable tunnel with potentially some hope and light at the end of it. Successful entrepreneurs see the tunnel as constantly the lights around them, the moments and opportunities that they can choose along the way. So failing is testing, it's trialling, it's doing something that didn't work and then getting back up and trying something different. And if you ask the question on Quora of, you know, what do I do after my startup failed? You just see, bang, 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 start again. Start again, do it differently. Start again, do something differently. Change, reflect, start again. It's the constant lights all the way down the tunnel that they're looking for to learn from and, and, and gain insight from. So many of us would sit there with an attitude, oh God, I fail to succeed. These guys don't. I fail sometimes in order to succeed. It's a different mindset. And then rebirthing. Rebirthing for many can be a painful process, having to reinvent yourself after that failure. For these guys, it's not like this. You know, it's a, it's a balloon ready to be blown up and inflated again into something magical. And they all go through rebirthing, and they're very, very happy and comfortable about rebirthing. So let me bring you to the guys who are our, our new future makers. These are going to be the next generation of new technologies and new products and new services that are going to change the way we interact in the world. And these are just local guys sitting here in iLab, down the road a little bit. A few of them are in the room today, so go and hit them up. And I wanted to quickly talk about their stories. So here's Christy in the corner. So Christy's built a platform that uh, um, introduces uh, brides-to-be, who've got a lot of money and got a time that they have to spend it, um, to venues and service providers who sit all around in that market. Now, that's a, that's a great model. And she's built that and she's launched it out just recently. She got her first inquiry the other day. We all got very excited about it. Someone's used the site. That's brilliant. And she's going to go on and she's going to keep doing this and build it out even further and it's going to be a great product. She's going to provide a great service. But this is not Christy's first time. Christy's done this three or four times to get where she is at the moment. So Christy's had to go through periods of really thinking about what she's doing, really thinking about her service. Sometimes it's failed. Sometimes, you know, she's kind of left it and put it on quiet hold for a little while. She's gone back and her rebirth is actually not about her product or her business. It's about her ability to execute. It's about her ability to push past the walls when they come up and it gets really, really hard. So she's had to really think about her attitude and her approach and the skills that she's got. So that was about her as an individual. Elliot Smith, Jeremy Herbert, Gavin. So this is a company now that has started with us a few, minutes, a few months ago and, and they're building a, a medical device that will have an impact on children, a significant impact on children. And really, these guys are, are doing great stuff. They've got a great attitude. Um, you know, they, they're doing everything that needs to be done in terms of building out this product. A little story for you. A couple of weeks ago, I met with them, and I meet with them on a regular basis. How's things going? How's your product? How's your board production? How's your designing? How's your logo going? You know, what finances? Are you talking to the right people? Yeah, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. It's great. Gosh, it's so easy, isn't it? It is, guys, but hang on, you're going to hit a wall at some point. And when you do, the three of you stick together and you, you approach that wall and you smash it down. Yeah, yeah, we will. We will. It's all, this is so cool. It's so easy. I love it. So I go back to my office and two hours later, as I'm tapping away on my laptop, I get a knock on the door. Bang, bang, bang. Three grey faces. We think we just hit the wall. Tell me about it. So after my meeting, they sat down with a mentor and a mentor, and they, you know, presenting their project to the mentor, and the mentor said, "Hey, I've seen this before. I saw this a couple of months ago from another, you know, group of guys out of another country, and they got patents and they, you know, developed and there's a product and it looks exactly like yours." We grouped immediately, we sat in the room, we did all the research that we could as quickly as we could to find out what patents, what's, what's around, you know, who are they, what are they doing, how advanced were they, how do we solve this problem of, of a competing product. And now they're putting in strategies around it. 
but at the end of it, and, and you know, the, these are all sorts of things. There are tactics that we're doing, and I've been there before. I, I've been in their position before, where there's been a giant company who's just released a product that's competed with mine, or which I've spent months and months building and trying to develop and release. It's a tragedy, but it's not the end of the story. So we stopped, we regrouped, and they have gone back out there again. And we've said it, it's business as usual. Let's keep progressing. They got the wall and they're pushing through it as we speak. It's a great place, but it's a characteristic of, t you know, they're, they're tenacious, they're passionate about it, they didn't crumble, you know, it's, it's a prickly world and they're just pushing through that. Here's Hugh. Hugh has, uh, Hugh has successfully raised almost a million dollars as we speak through institutional capital down in Sydney. He's going to go on now and produce a product that will be fantastic and will you know, help a, a lot of people out there and he'll be known as a great entrepreneur. This is not Hugh's first time. This is Hugh's second or third time as well. Hugh will talk about you know, the embarrassment of over-promising and under-delivering a service in another business that he did and how it took him a couple of years to get over that experience. But he's back and he's, and he's doing great. He's starting to really raise capital. He's into product development. He's on his way. So these are the guys that are going to create our future. I guess a question for you. You know, many of you are there here sitting with ideas. Who has ideas that you think are going to have impact and have the potential of changing people? Hands up. Big hands up. Great. You're my rock stars. You are the people I want to be with because you are the future makers. And I believe we together will make it extraordinary.